or or this book, your podcast, your interest in in the, mm. the confluence or the nexus between business and psychology, all these things. Um, How did you end up there? Why why didn't didn't you end up being an archaeologist or a historian or a, a feminist? Why why did you end up there? To be sure, I happy to talk in detail. To give you a, a short answer, I think it's destiny. I mean, by destiny, I can sense this when I was little, and、uh, I, I came this way subconsciously. It's not. It's not determined by me in a sense, and、mm. I just other way just doesn't work for me. I don't enjoy it, and I work in. Marketing, work in business, and、uh, never really enjoyed that much. And to, until thanks to COVID, I had the opportunity to be home more.、Uh, I started writing stuff, and、uh, after two articles, I thought I could be an author. So I decided to write a book. <laughs> and then <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a very big leap. So, and this journey just completely transformed me.、Uh, I would say the past few years. Um, that's where I landed on this interview. I landed on this book, and、uh, I just almost reborn as a another person based on the previous version of me,、uh, my understanding from the world, and I'm just always into this, 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 this. A region of humanity, if I have to say it in a broad way, not to be specific. Yeah, always into this human thinking. So, what what interests you more,、uh, people or their actions and choices? Oh, I didn't know they're separate. But、uh, what interests you more? Because you could observe the actions and choices of of people without. without Without knowing much about the in-depth psychology, you could attribute to them all kinds of motivations, which are facile and you know easy. But actually, there's a big depth. So some people focus on the depth, and some people focus on the facade, on the appearance. Death. death. Which is it? Which is it for you? Death. The, for the、sure. depth. Which one is the, the death? death again? Is the human thinking or the people? The human thinking. The、people are like an archaeological site.、Mm-hmm. They have they have layers from different periods in history. Yeah, and these layers are underground. They're invisible, but they shape the con they shape the contours of the land. And so people don't realize that they are walking on an ancient Roman Roman road, or that their their homes are built are built on top of homes. So it's it's the same with human psychology. We have layers and layers and layers of personal history. Yeah. And we think we think that we we have rational choices and a decision making process which is structured and algorithmic. But actually, we are driven. We are driven by this archaeology, and this is why we have today the burgeoning field of、um, behavioral economics, which essentially says that people are not rational agents;、mm-hmm. that they are they are driven and motivated by what Freud used to call depth depth psychology, deep deep psychology, depth.、Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Sam, I, so you could so in this case you could come and see a neighborhood and you、mm-hmm. say, well, let me describe the neighborhood. There's、mm-hmm. this street, there are traffic lights, there's this house, there's these gardens, and that's okay.、Mm-hmm. Or you could come to the neighborhood and say, okay, there is this neighborhood, but before that there was a colonial neighborhood, and underneath it there's a Roman neighborhood, and underneath it there's and so that's the depth psychology. Wow. Oh wow! I like that glass of wine. <laughs> Is it dry or so do, sweet? So do, so do I. I'm attached to it. <laughs> attached to it. One、it's、glass a, a day. It's dry. Dry, dry. of course. Dry. 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 I like dry.、Mm. Nice. First guest、well, that enjoy a glass of wine on my talk. I like it. Yeah, why not? It's it's a part of life.、It's、a pleasant part of life. Yes. I do like dry wine.、Mm-hmm. Do you were you born in the United States? No,、nope. you're not. No. Do I look like? What do you think? Where I born? Oh, oh, you're not. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as an American look. I mean, it's very, <laughs> diver, very diversified.、So、yes, yes. You might as well been born in San Francisco or something. It's not. 
doesn't doesn't mean anything. The way I look doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Thank you. So where uh -huh. where where were you born, if I may? Uh, can you guess? I'm sure no. you've met people. Well, I thought maybe I thought maybe I thought maybe mainland China, but I'm not sure. You're not sure? Okay, <laughs> I am. Yeah. I am born there, and my last yeah. name kind of sold me already. The last name yeah. Wang. It's a very typical. Chinese last oh, there's a huge, there are huge um, Chinese diasporas yeah. all over the world. So your name <laughs> means nothing. I mean, you might as well have come from Paris. Yes, <laughs> you're, you're so right. From... Yes, yes. I like your your deep understanding <laughs> of this <laughs> this thing. Yes, it could be from everywhere. You're right. Yeah, the name doesn't mean anything. But um, mm -hmm. So you were born in mainland China, and then you made all the way to the United States yes. as, a, as, a, as a student. Yes. As a student. Yes. That's wonderful. Thank you. And then, and then you decided to stay. Yes. Why, if I may? I feel I feel good. I can describe exactly why, but in a general way, I feel good, um, physically, mentally. I can't say why. Of course, okay. some, some reasons. A uh, nice environment and also maybe the culture, but I'm not too sure now. After being here for so many years, I think deep in me, I'm I'm definitely a Easterner. I possess those Eastern culture mentality, but I'm also very enjoying the, just the 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 way people communicate freely. Um, it's also very deep in me. Um, uh, I can't hide that. I just feel more myself, in in every way. Yes. So if you if you had been in China now, you would not have fit in. You first you would have oh, been um... for sure. For now, for sure. <laughs> now mm. for sure. Uh, but even before, uh, I I wouldn't think it would be the best place for me. I think mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. In many. So ways. you've made you've made all the right choices. Well, uh, also thanks to my parents, I I can say I'm the one fully. Uh, made a decision on this uh, but my parents have definitely didn't expect me to be here for <laughs> for so long they were sending me here just for school and they were expecting me to be back after several years uh didn't happen <laughs> so you have no siblings no uh you know yeah. one child policy right In yeah, yeah yeah that's why i'm even asking, though yeah. they changed it they changed it no, no it's straight shot Right? Oh, it's free child policy, yeah. Right? But no one wants have... the second child. No, 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 no. The second or, or the third child. No. No, no. up to three or alone. No. Oh, well, you know better than me. Uh, yes. <clears throat> but no one wants, no one wants children anywhere, not only in China. It's a general trend. Childbearing is uh, collapse. In all industrialized nations, yes. the replacement, replacement rate is under 2.1. So that means the populations will shrink dramatically by 2050. Not only shrink, but become much older. About aging, 25, right? aging, yeah. Mm -hmm. About 25 to 50 percent of the population, depending on the country. Sam, I couldn't see your whole face. Like, I can't see my whole face? Many, many people would appreciate this. <laughs> many people would be very happy with this. <laughs> you're, com you're complaining. Why are you complaining? <laughs> I have to. I want to All see right. you. Here I am. <laughs> My entire face. Yeah, I like your I like your presence. I like this cozy space that you have. And I love it because I've been watching your video. That's exactly where you at when you're shooting all this YouTube and it feels so mm -hmm. special to see this in person, virtually in person. <laughs> Thank you. I'm I'm surprised by your background. Why? Tell me, please. It's very minimalistic. It's minimalistic. very important. interesting. What what do you mean? It's minimalistic in the sense that you have a um, meshed wire chair. Oh, oh, you mean this background? Oh, I yeah. About my background. No, oh, no, 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 no. The background behind you. Thank you. It's, Thank it's you. It's very it's very minimalistic. It's clean. It's not cluttered. It's clean. Uh, right. It's straight straight lines. It's very cobwebby. It's very <laughs> so it's very modern. Thank you. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Uh, it's a minimal style. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. It's very, very modern. Not even postmodern, but modern. It's mm -hmm. uh, functionalism, what used to be called in architecture, functionalism. Wow. It's very nice. Thank you.
Thank you. Yes, I like it. It's clean. clean. It's clean. Yes. Yeah. Simple. I wasn't like this before COVID, by the way. You weren't like that before? I wasn't into minim uh, minimal style, minimis, uh, minimalistic style, or I wasn't aware. Um, but uh, now I'm just more and more, I, I don't want distractions. I want things to be, if I can get two, I don't want three. <laughs> yeah. Oh, who knows? Maybe I'll change. You're a bad, you're a bad controller. You can tell me. <laughs> Maybe I'll change one day. <laughs> You're a bad, you're a bad consumer. I'm you bad. don't want three, you want two. Yes. You're going to destroy I'm... the global economy single-handedly. <laughs> yes, people like me should be banned. Yeah. Banned, absolutely. <laughs> Banished <laughs> into an island with two, with two palm trees, not three. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And may I ask, what did you see? Do you don't mind that I'm asking all these no, personal questions? I'm you're, not you're, good at hiding. You can tell from my face if I don't enjoy the conversation. So if I don't show right. that, okay, don't fair worry. enough. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just intrigued by you, honestly. I'm intrigued by you, especially after I began to read the book. So what, what, what did you study? You studied marketing and economics. Economics. Yes. Uh -huh. And you have a degree in economics. Yes. Uh, bachelor. A bachelor's degree? Yeah. You know that uh, you know that for the first twenty-five years of my career, I was uh, an economist, and um, I was mm -hmm. economic advisor to governments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I work with the IMF, w, uh, WHO, World Bank, and so on on development economics. So I was into economics, and now I'm a professor of finance, actually, <laughs> and, a, and a professor of psychology too, both. I don't see much difference, mind you. Finance is a branch of psychology. Yes, under it. And, yes, and so and so is economics. Interesting. There's a confluence of psychology and economics. There's a field called behavioral economics. Behavior. Be uh -huh. Behavioral behavioral economics. Behavioral. Okay. Did you ever study? Did you ever have, have a look at it? Uh, I don't remember. No. I think it would interest you greatly because it's a combination of psychology and economics. Psychology and economics. And economics, yes. It's called behavioral economics. And um, some some of the proponents of behavioral economics lately won Nobel Prizes. So it's a well-established mainstream branch of economics. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I were you, I would have a look at it, because I think, judging by what I've heard, I think it might interest you a lot. Oh, I have to trust that. I would definitely look it up. Um, indeed, indeed. In in essence, I'm interesting a lot on meaning on things about human, the future, the end, all that type of things. Do you think? I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you just said. Would you mind repeating? Yes. Uh, in 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 deep, I think I'm very interested in the m meaning, the the destiny, the. Our region, I think the origin could mean the end, the end of human, of um, of the world. In mm -hmm. the where, where humanity is going, that's what you mean? Yes. And also, Wait. I just genuinely enjoying human connections. I do businesses, I, you know, I do all this economic stuff. I don't really enjoy them. I don't know why. Uh -huh. you, enjoy, you enjoy working with people. I enjoy the genuine connection between people. I build meaningful things on top of it, just benefit everyone in gen, uh, you know, as a consequence, not even a purpose. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. But do you enjoy a human connection or human connectivity? Do you enjoy it personally or do you enjoy to observe it as an observer? Both. I do it at the same time. I don't, uh, oh. yeah. You're a good networker. I'm a people pe people person. Yeah, I enjoy uh, being around uh, being around people. Actually, recharge me, and by myself for too long drains me. It's the opposite for other people I know. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I need a balance of both, but uh, probably more a people person. Mm. That's not uh, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. We need more of that. Because um, culture and society, modern civilization, mm -hmm. 
is pushing in the opposite direction. We are encouraged to detach and disconnect. So work from home is an example. Mm -hmm. um, Self-sufficient entertainment. Yes. You're at home, you have Netflix, you don't need anyone. Yes. Social, me social media. These are all examples of, I mean, anti a social media. These are, all, these are all examples of incentives. People are incentivized to be alone. And I think the reason is a bit sinister, a bit conspiratorial. Because when people are alone, they consume more. Um, there is a compensatory mechanism. When you're really, really alone, you feel not so good. Mm -hmm. And you try to compensate by buying things. By other so form it, of things. Mm -hmm. Self gratification, yes. Mm -hmm. So you're buying things. And you're also much more um, on, for example, social media. So they can monetize your eyeballs. Social media has an incentive to keep you alone. Absolutely. Because if you have a boyfriend, mm -hmm. you will dedicate your time to your boyfriend and you, you will not you will not enrich Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Very simple. It's either or. It's mutually exclusive proposition. Yeah. If you have a life, you have a life, yeah. you're not on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So they don't want you to have a life. They want you to be on Facebook. You know, all this is in my book. <laughs> Part, not as deep as what you're talking. That's why I guess I was originally uh, drawn to you. Uh, this conversation is going on so well already. I don't even wanted to break it and start a, a, a interview or stuff. We can just continue. I know how to transition this talk. And um, no, we can we can stop yeah. the record because I would like to have something with you, some kind of interview or something. But it doesn't have to be an interview. It, it could be a it conversation. Will be yeah, a conversational. I like the the flow. It, it really flows well. You you kind of naturally go into the topic I wanted to ask you. So I really so enjoy it. Yeah. Let's start to record. And if you have any questions, and you can start with questions, and we will take the questions and convert them into a conversation. Is that Absolutely. okay? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm starting to record. Are you recording already? I am. No. I am. Oh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> this I have is not nice. <laughs> There's no disclosure here. I could have said horrible things. You could have blackmailed me after this. You could have blackmailed me after this. Okay, you're recording? Great. Can you send me your file after that? Yes, I'm recording the screen, the screen recording. And uh, okay. please also record on your end so we have... I will record right now, but, yes. but we have missed, I've missed quite a lot. So can you send me your Absolutely. file after this? Absolutely. Yeah. And you I will the, transfer. You have the full rights to use it. I don't mind at all. I want to use it. I have a channel yes. with, I have a channel with uh, two hundred and something thousand subscribers and please. fifty million views, and I want please. to upload it there. Okay. Do it, so please. I, so I'm starting to record, but you will also send me a file, which I is more, more, more complete. Absolutely. Here we go. Well, I heard it. Recording in progress. Awesome. So now you have to put on your official face <laughs> because recording is in progress. <laughs> You will see not much different. <laughs> All right, that's good. I wish I could do better. <clears throat> yeah. So okay, we, we'll we'll start. Oh, let's let's just talk. Let's yeah, have fun. let's just talk. Ask me ask me what you want to ask. Him. Okay. Let's see where it takes. Where well, it takes. I, I want to greet you no matter what. First, Sam, thank you for being here, taking the My time. Pleasure. I really appreciate. It. My pleasure, always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for referring to my work in your book. Digital Mind of Tomorrow. I, it's on my reading list. Actually, I was tempted. I started to read it. And I'm going to read it on my forthcoming trip to Romania. So this is my reading material then. But thank you all the same for sending me a copy. Thank you so much. You are a big part of it. I can I cannot not send it to you. I'm actually <laughs> very um, excited. I would say also looking forward to talking with you. I'll explain why. In a sense... Um, this book or everything I've been doing uh, lately, it's to observe or we, we talk about it, to see the world through, including this book, through the lenses of business, technology, psychology, sociology, and philosophy. And uh, based That's on... Quite, that, a, quite a list. Quite <laughs> a list. Um, there's a reason I kind of put this combination. It's not randomly. And um, based on my observation of you, 
and you were one of the few people, or I would even say probably the first person I came across that kind of touched on all of them, uh, in a in a decent way, not just you know I know about them. You are oh, I have it here in case I forgot. <laughs> You are a writer, you are an author, and you are a professor of psychology, and you have a PhD in philosophy and physics. Correct me if I did my wrong research. And you also used to be in business, and you also told me about that yourself. You're in economics, and you know about technology. Plenty of your videos showed me that, and you not just know on the surface. You know deep in the roots. How it affects the world, meaning the humans. Yeah. So, that's because I. That's because I was Israel's、uh, first venture capitalist. <laughs> so when I was much younger, I started the venture capital industry in Israel, which is now second in size to United States. And I was also a stockbroker.、Mm -hmm. So I learned about the nexus, the, the confluence between finance and technology. Right. And.、Um, So my background is is highly unusual because the first、um, the first twenty years of my life I've been in I've been into physics and and philosophy and I finished my doctorate I was I'm also a medical doctor so I finished medicine、mm -hmm. but then I gave up on academia and I went to business and then within business I focused on commodity trading and then from commodity trading I branched out into finance and from finance to venture capital and technology and I'm talking like fifty years ago forty years ago. That's when it was not that popular, <laughs> <laughs> and then the last twenty-five years, I, I dedicated to psychology, and、uh, in between, I was an economist and economic advisor to governments. Now, if you live as long as I have, you will also have nine or ten careers. <laughs> That's totally normal. Don't be too impressed. It reflects my age. Thank you.、Uh, thank you for being so humble.、Um, I do know people also work their entire life on one occupation, and also people like you. I appreciate both of them, and、uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. And now we know you、uh, quite a lot based on your professional background. This is the question I ask almost all my guests. Now tell us about you as a person with three words. Meaning, if you have to choose three words to describe yourself. What are those words, and why you chose them? I am fiercely protective of the truth. I'm addicted to the truth, and I will make personal sacrifices. And unfortunately, I will sacrifice other people as well, their emotions, in order to propagate the truth. But I'm not sure that I'm doing it out of A moralistic judgment or a moral, moral cognition. I think possibly there's a little sadism in that. Because <laughs> the truth hurts, and I know that the truth hurts because I'm a psychologist, and yet I continue to wield it as a blunt instrument. So I don't think I should be praised for that. <laughs> But that's the first.、Mm -hmm. The second second attribute is、um, um, fairness and, and justice. I'm very exercised when they are lacking, and the third is the the surrealistic and supernatural belief in the ability to communicate information, truth, facts to people, despite all evidence to the contrary, and despite everything we know in psychology about cognitive biases and cognitive distortions, which tell us, which tells us that. People are not open to、uh, confront facts, to modify their opinions, to alter their behavior. People are not malleable. They are not flexible. They are very rigid, extremely rigid. And when the rigidity reaches a certain point, it's called personality disorder. Most people are on the verge of personality disorder. That's why it's very difficult. It's very difficult, but. Everyone around me is a narcissist, which of course is not true. <laughs> But everyone around you could be narcissistic, could have a narcissistic style, as Lynn Sperry calls it, narcissistic style. Because people are always on the verge of a personality disorder because they are very inflexible; they are not open. That's 
these are my three traits i think interesting interesting thank you thank you for open up for us. oh the fourth the fourth is i like red dry red, red wine. wine red wine, red wine. the mega pint the mega pint yeah. <laughs> that's a mega pint it's definitely a mega pint in terms of wine it's a mega 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 pint <laughs> Mega point. Thank you. Thank you. So now, ready for the questions? Always. Always. Are you ready for the answers? That's the question. <laughs> Always. <laughs> All right. Then we make a we make a perfect pair. Yeah. <laughs> so, hear me out. So, what's your understanding of the following terms, following words, and what is your understanding of the relationship among them? These are the words: heart mind brain intelligence and consciousness five sorry if it's too long i want to hear out your understanding of them and what do you consider the relationship among them intelligence is the capacity to observe connections mm -hmm. between ostensibly separate and disparate phenomena and objects mm -hmm. so it's what we call synoptic view Intelligence is the ability to have a synoptic view. This, this, connect, this ability to connect generates insights. And insights allow you to reframe reality in a way that yields new information, which you can then leverage to obtain favorable outcomes from the environment. In other words, intelligence renders you more self-efficacious. But what people fail to understand Mm -hmm. is that intelligence is like electrical energy. It's a resource. Mm -hmm. It's like electricity. Mm -hmm. It's a utility. Mm -hmm. It can be used by the positive aspects of your personality, mm -hmm. or it can be abused by the negative aspects of your personality. It's neutral. It's value neutral. Not so the heart, what you call the heart. The heart is, of course, a pump, a very simple pump. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not what you meant, I assume. <laughs> but the heart, the seat of emotions, or the proverbial seat of emotions, the metaphorical seat of emotions, mm -hmm. is not value neutral. It does reflect underlying beliefs, values, mores, social and cultural uh, impositions like socialization, acculturation. It reflects personal history. And so on. So it's a much more, much more varied thing than intelligence. The emphasis starting in the First World War, the emphasis on analytical intelligence, as represented by IQ, mm -hmm. reduced is a part of a general trend of reductionism in psychology, which culminated with behaviorism in the in the 1960s, mm -hmm. where people were considered no different to rats in a laboratory and still are to a large extent, because we presume to, we presume to conduct experiments mm -hmm. on people, mm -hmm. when actually you cannot conduct experiments on people, because they are the type of subject matter who is affected by the experiment, and also who changes from one day to the next. Consequently, we can replicate fewer than 10% of psychological experiments, which means there is a replication or replicability crisis in psychology. The heart is the core. It's very complex and it's intimately connected to cognitions. Nowadays, we consider emotions to be a type of cognition. When cognition is coupled with sensor, with sensory input, that's what we call emotion. Emotion is reactive, exactly like many cognitions. It's a subspecies of cognition. So the mind and the heart are two sides, two flip sides of the same coin, not as we used to think. There are two flip sides of the same coin. We know, for example, that if we have a thought, mm -hmm. it can induce an emotion. Mm -hmm. And if we have an emotion, it often causes us to think in certain ways. Mm -hmm. They are intimately connected. Mm -hmm. So that's the mind, the heart, intelligence, the brain is a very difficult issue. <laughs> yes, it seems to be the simplest, but actually it is very controversial. 
You see, we have this presupposition mm -hmm. that the brain is the seat of identity and the seat of the mind. This is highly contentious, both in psychology and in medicine and physiology. I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. Most of the hormones that regulate mood are not produced in the brain. They're produced in the intestines. Serotonin, for example, is produced 91% in the intestines, mm -hmm. not in the brain. Another example is that the connection between the brain and the spine is not clear. We know, for example, that spinal fluid at night when you sleep mm -hmm. cruises through the brain and cleanses it, cleans it. It's like a cleaning crew in a, in a high rise, you know, at night. And yet we don't know why does this fluid come from the spine and where does it go afterwards or what does it do afterwards with the allegedly the dirt. <laughs> the, we also have no idea about most functions of the brain. We have no idea what is sleep, what is dreaming. We don't. We know very little about the brain, and what we, yet with hubris, <laughs> yes. the inglorious hubris, we claim that we know everything there is, or almost everything there is to know, and we even administer drugs or medications that affect this very sensitive organ without knowing what the hell we're doing. It's a very dangerous game, not on the philosophical level. Correlation is not causation. We can establish correlations between mental events and physiological events, biochemical events, electrobiochemical events. We can establish this connection. And this connection is very regular, like the rising of the sun in the morning. But we have no idea if the mental events cause the physiological events or vice versa. They are correlated, but we have no idea about the causation. For example, the brains of psychopaths are very different to the brains of normal people. In terms of gray matter, white matter, the striatus, the amygdala, most regions of the brain are very different, and the functioning of the brain is very different. Yet, was this caused by the emergence of psychopathy in early childhood, because psychopathy starts in early childhood. Mm -hmm. Was this called, because the brain is forming and sh being shaped in early childhood. Mm -hmm. Was the psychopathy the cause of these, these fun malfunctions or abnormalities? Or was the abnormality already present at birth? We don't have an answer to this. We don't know what causes what. And so I would be very careful about the brain, extremely careful. I am of the mind, and mind you, this is only speculation. Mm -hmm. It's not substantiated. I'm of the mind that the distinction between the brain and the rest of the body mm -hmm. is both artificial and counterfactual. I think if evolution and nature act in rational ways, mm -hmm. if they adhere to scientific reasoning, so to speak, <laughs> processing would be distributed not centered in one organ. I think most of our mental functions are distributed throughout the body. And I think the focus on the brain as the exclusive seat of mental life, including cognition, emotion, analysis, you name it, mm -hmm. has led us astray because we had neglected the rest of the body. I fully believe that there is what used to be called distributed parallel processing. In other words, what we call today connectionism. I believe the whole human body right. is one giant laboratory of mental life. Now, we know it's partly true because, for example, when we amputate people, mm -hmm. there is phantom limb, phantom limb syndrome, where the, the person continues to feel the missing limb long after the missing limb is gone. It seems that there is some kind of processing going on on the local level. <laughs> we know that the, the gastrointestinal system has a mind of its own. In essence, a second brain. We know that many areas of the body are not connected to the brain. And yet, they continue to function perfectly. We know there's a lot of information 
Mm. That doesn't reach the brain at all mm -hmm. from parts of the body, big parts of the body. Mm -hmm. And finally, we know that the brain consciously registers less than 5% of the information it receives. Less than 5%. Right. And what the, brain, what the brain does, it generates on the fly models, simulations of reality. When you're listening to me, when you're looking at me, Luckily for you, you observe only or absorb only 5%. What, you, what you're doing, yeah. you, you, you create in your mind an image and a simulation of Sam Vakni. Mm -hmm. And when you're listening to me, because you listen only to 5% of what I'm saying, you're filling in the blanks. There's a, a series of heuristic extra, extrapol, extrapol, extrapolations mm -hmm. in the brain, mathematical models. Everything is happening in your mind, not outside. And I refuse to believe that all this is taking place only in your brain. Because if we were to meet face to face, mm -hmm. I would have an impact on multiple organs of you, not only on your brain, even if I don't touch you. For example, I would immediately exchange with you a molecule which contains 100 items of information about my genetic and immune system. And that is totally unconscious, non-deliberative. So vice versa, I, I will also sorry? send you uh, my molecules from my body to yours. Is it is this an interactive process from both? Yes, you're sending me a molecule, I'm sending you a molecule. Whenever people meet, they exchange this molecule. All people in all settings. But you see, People affect each other at a distance. For example, the, some fields of the brain extend up to 100 meters. Mm -hmm. uh, another example, when a woman passes next to a man, mm -hmm. and by the way, doesn't matter how she looks, and doesn't matter how old she is, shockingly, when any woman passes next to any man, regardless of age, looks, or whatever, mm -hmm. the level of testosterone production in the men increases by 40 percent four zero she just has to pass not to talk not to look not to interact in any way just to pass we are regulated by our environment all the time in certain personality disorders the regulation extends even to the most basic and minimal functions mm -hmm. like reality perception of reality a sense of self-worth and then we say that these people are disordered because their their external regulation is too much. But what we don't realize, yes. we are 99% regulated by the environment. That's why I am utterly against the counterfactual concepts of mm -hmm. self, individual, mm -hmm. personality. Mm -hmm. I think these are nonsensical concepts that came from Germany and Austria. Mm -hmm. In, at the end of the 19th century, when these were authoritarian societies with a unitary structure of government and a unitary structure in the family. So they established a hierarchy in psychology. The psychology that we are studying today, and that we are teaching today, is a 19th century German authoritarian thinking. And so there is a self. And the self is like the pater familias, is the father of family. Is like the Kaiser, you know, is like the Fuhrer, <laughs> yeah. the self. He is the leader. He is the, it's a German thing. Yes. It simply reflects cultural mores and perceptions and a civilization that's no longer with us. Today, we live in a network society, a distributed society. Mm -hmm. We must rewrite. I, I'm proposing to rewrite psychology from scratch getting rid of antiquated concepts like self and individual mm -hmm. and replacing them mm -hmm. with self-assembling networks of self-states. Mm -hmm. Much more fluid um, approach. So we have to rewrite. Does that mean human changed or, or the previous understanding was limited? How to approach this? Everything, everything we do in science mm -hmm. Well, known that everything we do in science is uh, affected by our culture, cultural context, or society, mm -hmm. beliefs, we, be, beliefs and values we hold. Mm -hmm. 
The people who created psychology were Germans. Mm -hmm. Wund, Freud mm -hmm. was in Austria. Mm -hmm. German sphere. This was, these were authoritarian societies with a unitary center of control, mm -hmm. with rigid hierarchical social structures. So they created a description so they of the human it. mind that, that looked the same. So it, it was, was a limited version of psychology. It's a limited it's, version. It's a culture, what we call culture bound. It's a culture dependent mm -hmm. version of psychology. And by rewriting, what do you mean? We need to fit into the mass humanity, not just based on one culture. We know that people are not unitary. Mm -hmm. They are not fixed. Mm -hmm. They flow. Yeah. People, a, a human being is a river. Yeah. Not a, not a lake, not a pond. It's a river. Mm. It's like Heraclitus said, Pantare, everything, everything flows. You can't enter the same river twice. There's no such thing as self. At any, at any moment, in reaction to other people, in reaction to environmental cues, mm -hmm. we tend to become different people. So You're what, not the same at, what's at the work. What's the role of psychology, if I may ask? What's the role of psychology? Sounds like psychology, there's no pattern. There's no way to trace. We constantly... No, no, no. You can, you can make an inventory. You can make an inventory of your self-states. If I were to observe you long enough, to your detriment, <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I, would be, I would be able to map out to com compile an inventory of your self-states. Oh. Uh, so I would know that you have, I don't know, eight or nine self-states, mm -hmm. and that when you are subject to humiliation, rejection, and abandonment, your self-state is psychopathic, which is the case, which is the case in borderline personality disorder. No. <laughs> they become secondary psychopaths when they're rejected, abandoned, and humiliated. Mm -hmm. So it's possible to, to make a map of you, a map. Got it. But, but to say that you are one mm -hmm. in all conditions, mm -hmm. in all environments, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. all people, all mm -hmm. the time, and you will remain this way to the end of your days, yeah. that is rank nonsense. It flies in the face of everything we know about human beings. But we don't dare. We don't dare confront this lie at the core of psychology. Still? First of all, yes. Still. First of all, mm -hmm. many people make a lot of money from this. Okay, yes. They are best, yeah, huge yeah, vested yeah. interest in the a lot, you know, coaches, mm -hmm. yeah. coaches, okay. psychologists, therapists, everyone makes a lot of money on this. It's an industry. Before I forget, what do you, what's your understanding of consciousness? Anything. Just your... There are some, there are some problems mm -hmm. that are unresolvable that will never have, a, have an answer in principle. Never mind how much you know, never mind how much you work. About never consciousness. Mind. Same. Consciousness is like God. These are concepts that are meaningless in the sense that you cannot assign meaning to them. For example, you cannot say true or false. Mm -hmm. They are meaningless. Consciousness, I dare you and defy you to define consciousness. God, there is no procedure I can think of that can determine if God exists or not. Similarly, there's no procedure I can think of that can help us define consciousness. We don't, not only we don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but we can never in principle know what it is. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that we are both the raw material, the subject, and the object. We are both observers, Right. And we, we, we are observing us. This creates effectively an infinite regression because you're observing mm -hmm. who? You're observing the observer. And the observer is observing you, observing the observer. And there's no end to this. This is the cycle, never ending. Mm -hmm. It's an infinite regression. There's no, there's no end to this. Mm -hmm. When you try to define consciousness, you engage in a process called introspection. Yes. You look, yes. you look inside, you, look, you observe yourself. Right. But some, someone must make this, someone must do this observation. Who is doing it? Who's the one? Well, who's the one who is observing? Well, another consciousness. Only a conscious entity can observe. 
So if you're observing your own consciousness, there must be a meta-consciousness, another consciousness, observing this consciousness. And of course, it's infinite. Yeah, <laughs> there's no that's interest. the rabbit hole, right? It never ends. Yes there's, no, yes, there's no way to define consciousness. Now, we do know, of course, mm -hmm. that we feel something. For example, we feel that we exist. Right. But even that is, even that is contestable. For example, how do I know that you're human? How do I know that when you tell me that you're feeling sad, you are feeling sad? And how do I know that what you define as sadness is my sadness? Mm -hmm. In other words, we have a problem to access other people's minds. We have to rely on self-reporting. Other people report and we have to rely on the veracity and the accuracy of these reports, mm -hmm. which is extremely bad science, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so the only mind we know for sure we have access to yeah. is ours. We have no access to any other mind, and therefore we cannot know anything about any other mind, period. The assumption that you and I have anything whatsoever in common mm -hmm is fallacious end of story because you can't prove it and you can't falsify it it's not subject to scientific to the scientific method prove scientific can i ask what's your understanding of science and what's your understanding of spirituality and how do you consider the relationship between the two how do you define them science is a method yeah to a method to establish a possible way to get closer to the truth without ever attaining it. Without ever it, attaining it. Uh -huh. Without ever attaining it. Uh -huh. It's a method of organizing observations in a way that will yield predictions that we can then falsify. Right. If these predictions cannot be falsified, it's not science. Science, therefore, relies crucially on the ability to be wrong. Science is not about being right. It's about being wrong. That's not me. That's Karl Popper. So, science creates theories, and then all the scientists, once there's a new theory, all the scientists are trying to destroy it, <laughs> trying to prove it wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, scientists have been trying to prove Einstein wrong for 100 years now. Everyone is trying to prove Einstein. People were trying to prove Einstein wrong within a few years from the publication of relativity theory. They were measuring light around the sun. Mm -hmm. You know, they were trying to prove him wrong. Mm -hmm. This is what science is about: proving proving theories wrong. To get the belief is, to the truth. <laughs> the belief is, is exactly the belief is that as we eliminate what is wrong, exactly like Sherlock Holmes said. Sherlock Holmes said, "If you eliminate what is improbable, whatever remains." However, un however unlikely, must be the truth. So science is the same. Science is eliminated. And, and then by process of elimination, it, science believes that it's getting closer to the truth. But science is a religion. It's a belief system. Science believes in the scientific method. Science believes in falsifiability. Science believes that, believe, scientists believe that observations have value and are somehow connected to reality and not, for example, to the human mind. Because I can construct a case easily that everything we see is not real, but a simulation, mm -hmm. easily. David Chalmers, the famous philosopher, yeah. even thinks this is the case. <laughs> so, but there's a series of beliefs that underlie science, and in this sense, it's a religion. It's a faith-based system. Spirituality is the kind of thing that I avoid because it's indefinable, exactly like consciousness and God. I don't think anyone agrees on what is spiritual. Any two people agree on what is spirituality. I think spirituality is the feeling of transcendence, the feeling that there is something beyond you and beyond the world which you cannot be captured with reason. So spirituality is anything Mm -hmm. that cannot be captured with reason, but with, for example, belief, mm -hmm. faith, faith in God, for example, or 
And so, and so we have two, two competing systems. Yeah. One system uses reason. Yes. To get closer to an alleged ostensible truth, which maybe doesn't exist at all. The very concept of truth is very contentious. Mm -hmm. And the other system is based on a leap of faith, as Kierkegaard called it. Is, is, is based on the belief, the belief that you can glean knowledge, even if it's only your knowledge, idiosyncratic, cannot be communicated. For example, in a mystical, in a mystical experience, yes? you can glean knowledge, not using reason, using other means, many other means, even mushrooms. <laughs> but you can glean <laughs> knowledge, reason. not using reason. So these are two, these two are in competition. And yes, they are mutually exclusive. Anyone who tells you that religion and science are compatible or that is, has no idea what is religion, has no idea what is science. S science is not compatible with religion because it's the religion of reason. And all other, all other doctrines and ways of thought and schools, they are not based on reason, while science is. Additionally, science uses a language, a highly specific language called mathematics. Mm -hmm. But mathematics can be used and abused in spiritual disciplines. For example, in astrology, there's a lot of mathematics. I so that's not, a, that's not a distinguishing feature. So there's no way these two can be compatible or merged in whatsoever no. sense. Never, ever. Yeah. Anyone who claims otherwise has no idea what he's talking about. And I heard, I heard a very interesting thing. I heard that uh, mathematics uh, people they 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 have the highest chance to get a, a mental disorder. Is that true? I'm not aware of this correlation. I may have missed some studies, but I'm not aware of this correlation. Although there were very famous mathematicians like Nash, mm -hmm. who, were who was a schizophrenic, mm -hmm. but there were mentally ill people in many other disciplines. So I'm not sure there's a necessary connection. Mathematics, mathematics is a language. Mm -hmm. It's the rudiments of language. It's mm -hmm. a language reduced to its base elements. Mm -hmm. It is extremely surprising, for example, why mathematics describes reality so efficiently. Mm -hmm. We have no idea. Mm -hmm. No one can give you an answer to this. Mm -hmm. But it's a core, core problem in philosophy and in, in, uh, in for example, physics. Yeah. Why is mathematics so efficient? We don't know. Why is logic so efficient? And logic is the is the is the forerunner of arithmetic. And so, why these languages? Let's call them formal languages. Mm -hmm. Why formal languages are so efficient when the world is not formal? Right. The world is fuzzy. Right. The world is fuzzy. The world is crazy. The world is chaotic. Yeah. The world blends and moves. The world is more like smoke. And yet, a highly rigid formal. <laughs> set of languages captures the world perfectly how is this possible we don't know the answer and it's a huge huge argument in in philosophy and, yeah. and, and science yeah this underlying code that seems running running this chaotic world um so carl gustav john said in his 1959 interview and he said, the only real danger that exists, it's man himself. And we are pitifully unknown of it. We know nothing of man, far too little. That's from 1959. Now, do you agree with him? Or anything changed for better or for worse? Nothing much changed, no. As far as the quiddity, the essence of what it is to be a human, what is what is the human experience, mm -hmm. I don't think much has changed for the very simple reason that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. You cannot really communicate it. No one has access to another mind and many, many experiences are so idiosyncratic, so individual that you cannot communicate these experiences. For example, if right now, because you're exposed to me, you will have a mystical experience. <laughs> <laughs> you will not be able to communicate it to me. Mm -hmm. Never mind how many words you will use. Mm -hmm. So this will remain forever trapped in your mind. Never get out. 
So the essence of, of what it is to be a human is still remains a mystery and will remain a mystery forever because of this barrier in communication. We have a concept in philosophy called intersubjectivity. It is the belief that people somehow, based on similarities and based on a contract, an agreement, can somehow develop empathy for each other. Mm -hmm. And intersubjectivity is highly dubious. Highly dubious, <laughs> to use the British understatement. So I don't think, I think each one of us is, a, is solipsistic as an island. Yeah. And I don't think there are any bridges between these islands and no cruise ships going between these islands. Mm -hmm. We're totally islands. Mm -hmm. We are, however, as islands do, mm -hmm. we are embedded in an ocean. Mm -hmm. And the ocean is this collective, what can, we can call mankind or humanity. There are dynamics which characterize masses of people. Many of these dynamics are negative. For example, the Nazi party or Trump supporters in, on January 6th. So many collective dynamics are very negative, mob, mob dynamics, crowd dynamics. But many of these dynamics are conducive to survival mm -hmm. and they do elevate us beyond the confines and the limits of a single human body. So this is the ocean in which all the islands are embedded. Jung tried to cope with it. He, he called it collective unconscious. Yes. Don't yes. ask. Don't Jung, by the way, Jung, by the way, suffered for five years from psychosis. He was hospitalized. He was a mentally ill, very mentally ill person. Mm -hmm. So he came up with all kinds of UFOs and <laughs> mm -hmm. he was a conspiracy theorist. Don't ask. But he had a few insights, a few great insights, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mixed with a lot of trash. So one of his insights was the insights of archetypes. Another insight was the insight of collective unconscious. What he was trying to say is that we all share a commonality yeah. which yeah. transcends transcends mm -hmm. our individual minds. Mm -hmm. And we operate within this lattice, within this network, yeah. sometimes unawares. And it is this network probably that determines us to a very large extent. Now, in the 1960s, there was a school called Object Relations School. Mm -hmm. And they said that there's no such thing as self. But what happens is we are the assembly or the assemblage or the, or the compendium of our relationship with others. So we are the end result the culmination of our relationships with everyone in our lives. Mm -hmm. This was called, this way they call it object relations, mm -hmm. like relations with, now by the way, in psychology, the word object means another person. <laughs> it just shows you, just shows you what psychologists are made of. <laughs> Psychopaths, all of them, especially professors of psychology. Okay, so, I love psychopath. Okay. Yes. So I, in answer to in a in a very in a very long answer to your question, I believe that we should to to find meaning and significance and direction and all these things. We should not look to the human body or human mind, but we should look, we should look to collective dynamics. I think it's another mistake in Western psychology, mm -hmm. psychology in the West. Mm -hmm. Again, you see the influence of culture and society. Yeah. Western societies are individualistic. Yes. So the psychology is the psychology of the individual. Yes. When actually I believe that 90%, if not more, of the relevant dynamics mm -hmm. are not individual at all. They're social. It's They're holistic. collective. Yeah. Holistic, yes. But you see again the effect of culture and society on, on so-called science. That's why I don't think psychology is a science. It's a pseudoscience. So you approve science, but you don't approve the psychology in this science uh, system. I'm a physicist. Mm -hmm. I'm a physicist. Mm -hmm. There's a new a new theory that I developed in physics that is now becoming mainstream, and I I hope would be of interest to people. What is that? So it's a theory. It's it's the equivalent of uh, it's like relativity theory, but on different premises. So it's a it's a global theory. It's a theory of everything. Um, we can go into it later if you want. 
Okay. But but I'm like I have multiple personality. I have half of my mind, which is a physicist. Yeah. So I'm used I'm used to rigorous exact science and to the scientific method and so on. Yeah. And then I'm teaching psychology. And psychology is not a science. Psychology, psychology is, is, not a science. is a pseudo no, it's a pseudo science. It's a it's a form of literature. It's a it's belief. The, it's a religion. You literature. Know. I would call it literature. Literature. It's yeah. it, it's descriptive. The greatest psychology to have ever lived, psychologist, is uh, Dostoevsky. No one exceeds Dostoevsky. Not Freud. Not anyone. Not not the the modern, you know. But psychologists want money, like everyone, and they want to be respected, like everyone. So they pretend to be scientists. Because when you pretend to be a scientist, you get a lot of grant money, and you can also make a lot of money because you're an authority, so you can charge people money for treatment, for this, for that. Also, you get to wear lab coats, you know, white lab coats, and you look a lot like a medical doctor. So it, it's good for the ego. And so modern psychologists, when you go to universities, Ivy League universities and so on, mm -hmm. and you go to labs, psychology labs, and they look like medical labs. But what are they studying there? It's nonsense. Experimental psychology is unmitigated trash and nonsense. There's nothing you can learn from it. And none of the experiments almost is replicable. It's total blooded. It's, I can't be, it's a scam, simply a scam. These are con artists. And I have to be blunt. Note it. Note it. We have this recording. People will hear mm -hmm. about it. I hope they can be aware. Whether they agree or not. Just to be aware. You mentioned in your one of the latest video. Dystopia. I'm sorry. Dystopian. Dystopian. We're so lost. That ever. Because we enter into an uncharted territory. We're so lost. And I, I said the exactly the same thing in the book, by the way, again, not to promote my book, but I just want to say the resonation. And uh, there are all types of issues. There's all types of challenges. And we seem to try to deal with them. And among them, I wanted to particularly mention the depression rate you mentioned. The mental issue has skyrocketed. While list material life, we're being the best situation ever the wealth, all this omnipresent technology. If you have to find out what are the costs, the root costs, not the laws, the regulation, we need to build another building or a rocket. I guess that's part of the psychology as well, because all this is by human. What are the causes? Periods of uh, transition mm -hmm. in human history are common. There's nothing special about our transition because we're in a period of transition, of course. There's nothing special about our transition by virtue of the fact that it's a transition. Transitions are normal. Mm -hmm. There are, however, two distinguishing features that had never ever before happened in human history. Mm -hmm. Never. Number one, we are experiencing transition in every field of life. Mm -hmm. You had periods before where there was a transition in gender relations, for example. There were periods like this. Transitions from matriarchy to patriarchy mm -hmm. happened a few times in human history. Mm -hmm. Or vice versa. You, for example, in North Africa, there was transition from patriarchy to matriarchy. Mm -hmm. So this transition happened. You had periods where people transitioned from villages and farms to cities, urbanization. Was a very traumatic transition, mega transition. You had periods where, where people adopted new technologies, mm -hmm. which were disruptive technologies and altered their ways of life in fundamental in fundamental uh, ways and this also happened yeah. a lot even in the middle ages we think the middle ages were stagnant and so on. actually middle ages were a ferment a hotbed of technological innovation of course in the 19th century industrial revolutions we had all this 
-hmm. Never in you, we had political transitions. Mm -hmm. In the 18th century, we began to transition from monarchies and empires to democracies. Mm -hmm. The French Revolution, mm -hmm. French Revolution, the revolutions of 1848. So each, each transition we had before. Mm -hmm. Never in human history. We had all the transitions at once, which is what we're having today. We have all the transitions, all of them at once. Gender transitions, political transitions, technological transitions, you name it, we are transitioning. We are not prepared for this. It's too much change. Alvin Toffler predicted this yeah. in his books, mm -hmm. in his book, books, The Future Shock and so on. This is the first distinguishing feature. Yeah. And there is a much, much more pernicious distinguishing feature today mm -hmm. that never happened before in human history. Mm -hmm. In previous periods right. of transition, mm -hmm. some institutions were affected and destroyed or replaced. Right. But most institutions stayed intact. They remained functioning. Mm -hmm. So in the 14th century, when you had the Black Death in Europe yes. and everything was falling apart, the family remained intact. The church was there. Your feudal lord still remained in the, on the land. The monarchy prevailed. In other words, even though you were experiencing as an individual, you were experiencing turmoil, right. revolution, and transition. Right. The institutions around you, your community, your church, your feudal system, the monarchy, everything around you was stable. There was stability. Mm -hmm. The transition was limited to some institutions and in some aspects. Mm -hmm. But 90% of institutions and dimensions of existence remained fixed. And stable. Inflation was close to zero for 300 years in Europe. Mm -hmm. Everything, even prices were stable. Mm -hmm. Imagine that the price of bread in the in the 16th century mm -hmm. was the same mm -hmm. like in the 18th century. Okay. Imagine. So, and this now is the first time in human history that all our institutions, without a single exception, have collapsed. We don't have families. Mm -hmm. We don't have friends. In 1980, a typical person, according to studies, mm -hmm. had 10 friends. Today, the number is one. We don't have families. We don't have friends. We don't have marriages. We don't have the church. We don't have the state. We don't trust experts. We don't believe the authorities. We don't. There's no nothing. There's no island of stability. There are no institutions. You are on your own, totally. You are experiencing as an individual the greatest by far moment of transition in human history mm -hmm. with multiple transitions in everything. Mm -hmm. Your gender relations, your marriage, your I mean, you name it, you are transitioning. Technology. You are your own transformation. Mm -hmm. Pandemics, wars, you name it. Mm -hmm. And yet you are all alone. Because no institution around you is functioning, and the institutions that are still there, you don't trust them. Including and this, mm -hmm. all this the is authorities. The first, yes, including all the authorities and experts. And this is the first time in human history. These two things are the first time in human history. Multiple transitions, I would say all pervasive, ubiquitous transitions, and no supportive institutions. So you are utterly on your own. Atomized, isolated, alienated, totally new. Mm -hmm. So people resort to fantasy because they can't tolerate reality. They can't bear reality anymore. So they retreat to fantasy. Mm -hmm. And they create technologies mm -hmm. that encourage fantasy. Soon to come, the metaverse, mm -hmm. which is the ultimate form of fantasy. You know? yes. They retreat. They're running away. They, they don't want to live in reality anymore. Reality is too much. Too brutal. No. Too, too unpredictable. People don't tolerate, people have low tolerance for uncertainty. 
Interesting. The uncertainty now is maximal yes. because even institutions are not there anymore. They can uh, keep up with all these changes. Too much. Powerless. They cannot keep up and they cannot look look up to role models, experts, authorities, institutions, God, church, family, community, I mean, someone, friends, something. They can't. There's nobody there. You're all alone. You're floating in a bubble. That's it. You're, you're on your own. If bad things happen to you, they happen to you alone. You know? So, of course, people have, uh, you know, online forums and this, that. It's simulation. It's nonsense. It's not real. We know, for example, that face-to-face -face communication, pressing the flesh, skin touching, <laughs> infinitely, is infinitely better impacts than any, any forum online. Yes. So you kind of answered my next question already. I was going to ask you the role of I, this. I have a tendency to do this. It's not nice of me. <laughs> A you have, person. You, you know. have the foresight to answer my question in advance. You know what I'm going to ask. The omnipresent technology. What's the role? And you definitely answered me already. I would say just to complete the sentence. Is I would say that um, depression and anxiety yeah. are reactions to this world. And the compensation is technology. Technology had become compensatory. This is another transition. I can enumerate right now, I can make a list yeah. of 50, 50 major transitions that each and every human being is undergoing right now. We cannot avoid this transition. They're all over. On a typical period in history, you had two or three transitions. Now there's 50 that I can think of. And if I think very hard, probably 100. One of these transitions is the role of technology. Mm -hmm. The main role of technology in human history until the 1990s. So that's a very long period. We are talking te technology. Technology started about 30 or 40,000 years ago when you took a, a flint, when you took a stone and you made it into a knife. You know. So tool, tool making. Tool. tool making started 40 to 50,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So technology is old. Until 1990. The main role of technology was to extend your body. Mm -hmm. So if you had a knife, it extended your hand. If you yes. were riding a car, it extended your legs. Yes. If you're reading a book, it extended your mind. I mean, it was all about extending the body. In 1990, there was a massive shift. Technology was no longer about extending the body. It was about escaping reality. It's a massive shift. May I, may, may I jump in a little question? What's the sh trigger for this shift? Why? Reality became, reality became unbearable. Unbearable since 1990s. It started before. It took, before. took time. Oh. took time for technologies to evolve. But I would say that around the 1970s, mm -hmm. 1970s, yes. life be began to become unbearable. Already. In the, United, in the United States, you had the Watergate scandal, you know, uh, collapse of the trust in authorities, in the media, in universities, and so on. Then the family collapsed, starting in the 1960s and 70s, the divorce rate went up to 50%. Then promiscuity, um, not agentic promiscuity, but promiscuity is a, a measure of desperation, um, made it very difficult to form relationships and couples destroyed intimacy skills. So relationships deteriorated. And today, for example, the rate of marriage is 50% less than it was, 50 percent less than in 1990. And the, the people are not compensating for this by, for example, cohabiting. So yeah, the perfect. general number of relationships is much down. Of course, childbearing, everything is totally collapsed. So in the 1970s, an existential crisis started. It took 20 years for technology to catch up. But you had you had the, the initial harbingers of technology. For example, you had dating apps in the 1970s already. <laughs> already. Yeah, already. Yeah. So computers, of course, 1980, you had Apple, 2C. You had the first Apples. Uh, before that, you had Commodores and Ataris and 
So you had you had harbingers. You could see it coming. Mm-hmm. You could see it coming. Mm-hmm. The internet effectively went went public in 1990, more or less. Mm-hmm. So it was all about escaping reality. Technology stopped. No longer was concerned about extending our capacities and our bodies, mm-hmm. but became much more concerned about allowing us to escape reality. That's the fundament of the purpose of technology. That's the problem. Today, yes. Mm-hmm. Today, yes. I would say, if you look at technology, first of all, innovation stopped completely. Innov- I know it sounds bizarre, but innovation actually stopped in more or less the 1960s. I know it, for example, from, psycho- from uh, physics. Yeah. Nothing really new since 1980. I know it from psychology. Yeah. Nothing really new since 1990. I know it from other fields. Nothing really new has happened in the past few decades. Even if you look at this, it's almost the latest Apple. Yeah. All the technologies, yeah. all mm-hmm. the technologies in this thing mm-hmm. are from the 1960s, 50s, and 40s. The all core, the core technology. All the technologies, all the chip technology. making, GPS. All there's not one technology in this in this iPhone yeah. that was invented after 1960. <laughs> not one. Mm. We are repackaging. All we are doing is repackaging, and this gives the illusion of yes. innovation. Yes. Even in medicine, I would say innovation stopped in the 1980s. mRNA vac- vaccines. Mm-hmm. Everyone says they were just invented. They were not just invented. They started 20 years ago. So innovation is dying all over. You cannot innovate if you're not in reality. And most people are no longer in reality. What is the reality? Reality sucks. Big time. Reality are these transitions. Reality is the lack of institutions. Reality is, is the disintegration of, of everything you can rely on and everything you've ever believed. Re- reality is terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I don't blame people mm-hmm. for running away from it, dissociating. Mm-hmm. You know, ent- ent- entertainment is a big, a big thing precisely because of this. What do you see out of this 50 or 50,000 transitions? What do you could see, I would say now? What do you could see? Well, not 50,000, but 50,000, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You see, the reason I'm pessimistic is because the transitions of the past were very clear. They were like from less to more, for example, less freedom to more freedom. They led somewhere. They were what I call directional transitions. They they had a vision. They had a vision. Now, not all transitions were good. For example, the transition to communism. Very bad idea. The transition to Nazism and fascism. Not all transitions were good, but all transitions were clear. It was very clear where they're going. Yeah, you could see that. The transitions today, Mm -hmm. transitions today are fuzzy. They're not clear. For example, I will ask you, where is the relationship between men and women going? (laughs) It's not clear. If you go to Afghanistan, Mm -hmm. if you go to Afghanistan, it's very clear. In Afghanistan, there's a transition. It's a bad, evil, vile transition, but it's clear. Yeah, you can. It's see, clear. You can Women see are becoming third-class citizens. Mm-hmm. So we don't have this vision. We don't have this clarity, and the transitions are fuzzy. They're, they're all over the place. They're leading nowhere. It's a bloody mess, and people disagree on the transition because when you when there was a transition to communism, or to Nazism, or to fascism. Or even to feminism, mm-hmm. there was a broad disagreement, a broad agreement. It reflected a broad agreement. For example, first wave feminism and second wave feminism. You, many men agreed with it. Many men supported it. Mm-hmm. There was a consensus between men and women, mm-hmm. which is why women obtained rights and so on because men supported it. But when you go to third wave feminism. And fourth wave feminism, which are today, there is no consensus. There's a war. Men don't agree. Men are fighting back. Women become more and more militant and angry and violent. So 
the transitions deteriorated because they had no no consensus. Agreement. They're mm-hmm. non-consensual transitions. They're power plays. We're talking about power. Mm-hmm. Who has more power? Mm-hmm. That's a very bad state of things because humanity crucially relies on cooperation. We are a cooperative species and cooperation relies on being able to somehow obtain a consensus. Yes. If we fail in this, we will disintegrate as a species. Now we think very, we're very arrogant species. We <laughs> think we are here forever. Let me tell you, no species was more successful than the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs occupied every ecosystem under the sea, over the sea, in land, on trees, you name it. Mm-hmm. Dinosaurs were in the air, they were on the, on the savanna, mm-hmm. they were in jungles, they were mm-hmm. on rocks. Mm-hmm. They were Dinosaurs ruled the earth in the truest sense. Mm-hmm. They occupied every ecosystem. Mm-hmm. There were big dinosaurs and small dinosaurs with wings, without with the scales, I mean, you name it. Mm-hmm. And they're no longer with us, are they? Mm-hmm. So humans shouldn't think that they are here forever and never mind what happens. You know. And hum- human evolution is no longer through the genes. It's through culture. Culture is, is the new human evolution. And if we cannot reach a consensus, this is a good definition of mutation. A mutation in genetic evolution Mm -hmm. is when there is a change, usually in a gene, Mm -hmm. in a gene, doesn't have to be, but usually in a gene, a change that doesn't sit well with the rest. Mm -hmm. So so this creates a conflict inside the organism. We are in this situation now. We have developed a series of mutations, cultural mutations, and we can't get over it. If we don't settle these internal disputes and reach some consensus, Mm -hmm. we are doomed. We are doomed as a dinosaur. (laughs) Absolutely. We are doomed. Is there any clue about how to settle this doomed situation? Any clue? The first thing is to realize that we are at a serious peril peril Mm -hmm. of extinction. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about climate change. Mm -hmm. I, for one, for one, doesn't think that climate change really threatens us. I think what it means is that we will have to rebuild many cities and we will have to adapt. We we'll have to adapt. We we'll have to invent new technologies. Of course, it will be a huge transition. It's very, but I don't think it threatens our existence. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it becomes warmer and hotter, and there are extreme weather events. We'll survive. What's this we will survive, <laughs> but we will not survive. Mm-hmm. conflicts and transitions which are fundamental to who we are, to our identity, and which we cannot settle, settle consensually. For example, between men and women. The, the conflict, the, the irritability, the, the friction between men and women mm-hmm. is not allowing men and women to have relationships. Yes. And so when they don't have relationships, they don't have children. This is a real threat. It's immediate threat. And so Can you refer it's one of them. Again, the real threat. What's the real threat in one sentence? The real threat is that if we don't reach a consensus on multiple on where mm-hmm. our transitions should head, mm-hmm. where they should go, mm-hmm. then we will no longer be able to collaborate. And I gave an example. Men and women don't collaborate on making children mm-hmm. anymore. Right. That's the statistic. Right. So if we don't collaborate, we're doomed. We will perish. We are not stronger than the dinosaurs. We're much weaker. We are much less successful as a species than the dinosaurs. We don't live in deserts. They did. Mm-hmm. We don't live under the sea. They did. Yes. They were much more successful than us. Yes. They're done. Wow. Almost the last sip of the mega pint. I didn't even realize. <laughs> I time it. I time it judiciously <laughs> and sagaciously. I can see that. <laughs> I finish my wine when the interview is finished. It's like a it's like an hourglass, you know, with a sand. <laughs> 
I can see this is a routine. Very good at it. So the last sip. How do we how do we make this last sip <laughs> worth it, meaningful? That's up to you. You're in the driver's seat. I'm at your disposal. We're in the drive. What really? What question really haunts you, bothers you? Question that you kind of never. Everything I asked uh, are part of my questions that really triggered me to find answers. And uh, why don't you <coughs> contribute a question? I mean, to yourself, not to me. Okay, no, I should ask you actually. What is your main message in uh, mm -hmm. in Digital Mind of Tomorrow in your book? What's the main message? You have to distill it into a few sentences. What are you okay. trying to say? What are you trying to do? Okay. Um, I actually started to figure it out, to be honest. Um, I think down the core, I'm trying to call for more humans. I found we're less and less humane, and we don't conduct human thinking. And I think that's a true threat for everything, because we're the one, as you mentioned, direct everything. If we don't collab, if we kind of lost our f human feature, our human traits, that is irreplaceable, and we're in real doomed danger. <laughs> yes. So you basically agree with me? Yes. Because you're, you're also saying that humans should collaborate and work together towards a better future and so on. And if they don't, then we're doomed. We should collaborate not just between human, among human. We should collaborate with the nature. It should be a whole holistic system because mm -hmm. we all kind of interact with a, one another, one object to another object. We can get out of this cycle. And I can't see any of us can be the, on this planet independently. So, yes, I agree with you. It's a good point because I think we have transitioned from life-centered civilizations to a death cult. What is a death cult? A death cult is when you invest your emotions mm -hmm. in material goods. Mm -hmm. You're emotionally attached to your smartphone. I saw, I saw people mourning the loss of a smartphone more than they grieved over a broken relationship. Seriously, I saw it. They were much more devastated when they lost a smartphone than when they lost a boyfriend. You know? We were invested in material goods which are which are dead. The objects are dead. It's a death cult. And so we have transitioned into a death cult. And nature is alive. When we had abandoned life as the organizing principle of civilization, and instead we introduce materialism, which yes. is a death cult. Yes. Then of course, naturally, we gave up on nature because nature is life. You cannot monetize nature. You cannot own nature. You cannot trade nature. All these activities are about death. They are thanatic. They are about death. Mm -hmm. Trading, buying, selling, owning, they're all about death. And now we are tr beginning to treat each other as objects, even in psychology. We call, it, we call people objects. We are beginning to treat it as... So if you are an object to me, I can own you. I can sell you. I can buy you. I can bribe you. You know, it's, it be, everything becomes a transaction. The same way I own my glass of wine or my, or my television, I can own you. We are commoditizing each other. We are beginning to treat each other as consumer goods as consumables. So we consume each other and then we dump each other. We dispose of each other. We discard each other. The same way you discard an old television because it's a new model. You know? mm -hmm. Everything, consumerism is a serious poison and it is the enemy of a true stewardship of nature. Consumerism is the opposite of nature. It's, it's about death. Nature is about life. So we cut forests. Forests are made of living organisms. Mm -hmm. They're known as trees. We now know that trees communicate. We know that trees you know, do almost everything except walk. Mm -hmm. We cut them down. Mm -hmm. Cut them down because we need to convert them into dead mm -hmm. objects. Mm -hmm. Then we sell these dead objects. And the people who buy these dead objects, yeah. they're made happy. Because they have a dead object in their living room. Yeah. 
I'll tell you how creepy this is. We live in a seriously creepy civilization, you know, mm -hmm. where we are surrounded by death and we find it extremely stimulating and wonderful. We live, 31% of us, 31% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. are lifelong singles. Mm -hmm. We'll never have another person in their home. We'll never have a living, so they have cats <laughs> or dogs. They don't have other human beings in their lives. Mm -hmm. But but they have televisions and smartphones and cars, and that makes them happy. Death makes them happy. We celebrate death. It's horrible. Horrible. And here's one thing. Yeah. If you celebrate death, yeah. death will celebrate you. If you celebrate death, mm -hmm. there will come a moment that you will internalize death. And you will die, and death will celebrate it. Death will celebrate you if you let it in your house. And we have let death into our abode, into our homes. And it's not the kind of guest who goes away. Cheers to the last sip of Mega Pine. <clears throat> Thank you. That, that Mega Pine, no. <laughs> There's nothing there. <laughs> Wow, thank you. Thank you for this thought-provoking, bold sharing between thank you. us. It was, among it was us. a pleasure. It was a pleasure to talk to you. I'm going to turn off the recording now. Okay. And I'm going to ask you something, okay? Sure. Recording stopped. Heard? Recording stopped. I suggest you stop your recording. Can you? Sure. <laughs>